Wilson is a man of science. He doesn't let futile things like emotion, bias, experience, or common sense get in the way of pursuing scientific knowledge. Over the years, and with several exploded chemistry labs, ruined friendships, and exploited connections under his belt, Wilson has devised a way to destroy the fine fabric separating video game genres, and do the unfathomable. Bring an RPG-inspired system to Don't Starve. Well, kind of. Science is cool. You like science, right? Uh, if you do, you should probably watch this video I made all about science. Specifically about a video game that's about science, but that's basically the same thing, if you don't think about it at least. I even went outside to show my dedication to science. Look at that, I'm so close to actually touching grass. Wilson's Refresh is an update to the video game that gives Wilson this strange new skill tree thing. Players can collect Inspiration, which is basically just XP by existing. Finally, a reward for mooching around at base camp and eating other people's food. Once you've acquired enough Inspiration, that is to say one, you can unlock a node Look, okay, I'm sure you weren't born under a rock, you probably know what a skill tree is. The tree has four categories, Torch, Alchemy, Beard, and Shadow. The upgrades in most categories make day-to-day -day survival a wee bit easier, namely the Beard section, which makes your beard much more powerful than insulator in winter, and faster growing. The final upgrade also allows you to store food in that beard, in an effortless imitation of Mr. Twit. Be sure to keep plenty of breadcrumbs and cornflakes in there for quick and easy on-demand snacking. The Torch section is mostly negligible, because by the time you unlock any Torch, upgrades, you've almost certainly obtained the Lantern, which is still a direct upgrade even with all the Torch abilities. The Torch throw is kind of funny though. This does bring into question the point of such upgrades existing because the Lantern exists. Even today, this item just dwarfs all other portable light sources. Like, it's not even a competition. Honestly, I kind of wish Wilson's upgrades would make torches more potent, because at least then you might see someone not using a Lantern in a DST server. The third section is interesting as well, permitting Wilson to finally do what the Alchemy Engine advertises, alchemy, except instead of turning things into gold, you can turn logs into sticks, gems into other gems, and stones into other stones. And you don't actually need or use the alchemy engine for it, so I guess not. This is probably the most interesting ability from the tree, and is the closest thing to a new ability Wilson now has. It permits you to turn one resource that you have an abundance of into another that you might be missing, a power which will especially be useful on pub servers where basic things like flint can be quite hard to come by. The gem transmutations are also notable, namely the ability to turn three orange gems into a yellow. While while it might seem like an awful exchange rate, orange gems are hardly used compared to the almighty yellow and green. However, some of the other gem transmutes are questionably useful. What exactly is the point of turning three blue gems into a purple when you can simply craft one with a blue and a red, which are notably the same rarity? The final tier does something special, but I'll talk about that later on when it'll make a bit more sense. If you ask me, Wilson is the type of deadbeat who would sit in the cafe and try to steal people's information, only to claim it was a scientific experiment and that you shouldn't be worried he just stole your credit card information. Sadly, in real life, these kinds of individuals do exist, except their hairstyle is probably a little less eccentric. Thankfully, there do exist easy ways to safeguard oneself against cafe-based cyber terrorists. This video is sponsored by ExpressVPN, a service that effectively puts a secure tunnel between your device and the internet, proving effective as armor against the kind of sweaty individuals who may be after your info. But it's not just people with strange haircuts trying to steal your goods. Big corporations, governments, and particularly ISPs have a lot of control over your data, something that ExpressVPN puts a stopper in by routing all your internet traffic through its secure network. ExpressVPN is available on a wide range of platforms, from Windows to Mac and even Linux if you're a connoisseur in oversized socks. I don't know what any of this means, but go ham, I guess. To get started, simply click the link in the description and get your first three months free. Free as in zero dollars. Nothing, nada, zip, zilch. The link in the description will help support me and allow me to make more videos like this if you do decide to use it. To repeat, click the link in the description for an easy three months free. Anyway, with that out of the way, back to the video. To me, the weirdest thing about this upgrade tree is that it's universal, as in it doesn't ever reset and is permanently synced across all worlds. This feels very anti-don't starve. Permanent unlocks associated with the player is just weird. It'll also take a lot of the fun out of playing Wilson on a fresh world, because once you have all the abilities, you just just have all of them and there's no more discovery to be done. Part of what makes a character with a unique progression enjoyable is discovering new ways to let the progression affect your gameplay. What's the best way to scan all the creatures I can early on as WX78? Do I want to risk getting my ass kicked by going to the ruins as Wanda? With Wilson's new upgrade tree, there's no question to be made. In a way, it rewards complacency, sitting around and just existing, instead of creating a new challenge for the player. But with that being said, Wilson is supposed to be the default character, and an extra layer to the game would probably make him too complicated to suit his role. But 
I don't know. Is encouraging new players to literally do nothing except survive really a good idea? I'm sure there are plenty of things that aren't necessarily challenging, but would instead encourage players to play the game actively, receiving insight for doing things like building the research stations, exploring the map, and prototyping items could work, as it would lay out the foundations of what players are supposed to do in the early game in order to progress, and could even serve as a sort of organically implemented tutorial. But that suggestion, of course, assumes that this gimmick is only ever going to be a Wilson thing, because if you ask me, it seems a little bit weird to go to all this length designing this intricate system with its own UI, icons, etc., only to slap it onto one character. I mean, I'm not trying to say it doesn't work as a way to give Wilson extra abilities that don't interfere with the main gameplay loop. In fact, I would say it does quite a good job at that. It just seems like quite the length to go to when Clay could easily have just given Wilson these abilities flat out. Better torches, beard hair storage, and alchemy themed transmutes could very well function as standalone perks without this bizarre skill tree thing. To me, it seems more likely than not that this is going to become a stock part of every character, and by extension, DST itself. Which is... Uh, I don't know. Weird? It is weird. Very weird. But to be honest, I'm not completely opposed to it. Realistically, if they ditch the whole permanent unlocks that are synced across your worlds thing, and make the upgrades bound to each individual game, I would be mostly down for it. It'd be something to make the boring early game a bit more interesting, with some new perks to work towards, and would also make stale characters more engaging, but wouldn't be by any means a substitute for a proper rework or update. Aside from the persists across worlds thing, my main worries about the skill tree mostly revolve around people taking advantage of it, via mods or cheating, or other smaller things that aren't really to do with the fundamentals of the system. And the more I think about it, the more those potential drawbacks seem less and less impactful. The potential here is astounding. Think of characters with blander gameplay styles who all of a sudden have things to work towards It could even bridge into subplay styles or niches within a character. This is only effective with a cap on how many perks one can equip at a time, the current limit being 15. This means you could lightly customize your character's playstyle to suit your current situation or goals. The potential for modding is also quite a big factor. Since this system already exists, it could be easily applied to other aspects of the game and not necessarily be limited to characters. Just think, imagine Winona being able to upgrade her catapults individually using this UI, giving them basic upgrades like better regen and firing speed that branch into special abilities, or a total conversion mod that uses the skill trees as a core part of its gameplay, such as an even more fledged out RPG or leveling system, or a tower defense mode where turrets can be upgraded, or anything really. Something that does limit the system's current applicability in granting characters a more distinct progression is the way you obtain insight, which is literally just given to you for existing. It could be more exciting to see experience points be given upon certain feats, like building a science machine or alchemy engine for the first time, exploring, reaching a certain point in the caves, and then of course more difficult feats like defeating bosses. And like I said before, this would also gently nudge new players in the right direction without forcing them, because like it or not, a lot of Don't Starve's new players lose motivation to play because they get lost in the early game very easily, a phenomenon easily observed in practically any public server. In my opinion, disruptive tutorials that interrupt a game's momentum and assume your intelligence to be that of a lump of compost have no place in video games whatsoever. Something like that would pretty much ruin Don't Starve's integrity as a game that encourages experimentation and exploration. Hey look, I made a video partially about this kind of thing in tutorials, you should go watch it. But if this hypothetical new insight system was done right, well, it would be a pretty good example of a tutorial that is somewhat naturally ingrained into the game. The second piece of content added in the update that isn't really to do with the Wilson rework is the this f***ing thing. The Nightmare Werepig, or Daywalker, will randomly appear in the caves as mud biome shortly after a world is generated. In order to release the creature, you'll need to break the three pillars surrounding it, and then break them again with the pick slash axe. If, for whatever reason, you didn't immediately think to use that obscure pickaxe item that everyone forgets about, you're officially an idiot. It's so obvious. For real though, the fact that you can't double break these pillars with gunpowder is also quite dumb. Your character comments that they need something stronger to do any real damage, but then gunpowder does nothing, which sort of defies all logic. Once you've managed to free the creature, it'll be attacked by some tiny shadow monsters. Go insane and smack him with your weapon to free the beast and begin the fight proper. The Nightmare Wear Pig will be so happy you freed him, he'll decide to reward you by caving your skull in. Goodness, how thoughtful. This is certainly an interesting fight. It's obviously an attempt at actually making a boss that isn't just total BS. There are no swarms of minions summoned every three seconds, no infinite stun locks, and attack that are actually dodgeable? Nutty. Oh, wait, it has health regen. Never mind, that's it, go home. It's no better than the rest of them. In between attacks, the pig will sometimes get tired, permitting players to get in a large number of attacks. However, getting hit by its charge will actually lower its fatigue, enabling the creature to get in more attacks before it tires. This adds an additional punishment to getting hit, 
aside from death. This style of combat seems vaguely from Softian. All that's missing is a dodge roll move. Good to know that the Elden Ring brain rot isn't just infecting me. It is genuinely nice to have a boss fight that isn't just engineered to kill the player as quickly as possible. Rather, it's obvious that intent has actually gone into how the player is supposed to survive. The main thing that takes away from this is the health regen, which feels a bit unnecessary and simply serves to make the fight more drawn out. The lack of a health bar and don't Start together means that it's not actually possible to know when the boss is healing unless you check the wiki or use a health bar mod. There's no special animation or effect in game to let the player know, aside from some easily missable dialogue, which is kind of dumb. The attacks that the boss uses are also fun to dodge and rewarding once you have them mastered. It is occasionally quite frustrating when the boss does this weird slide away from you when fatigued, which makes it difficult to hit effectively, and when it decides to perform a charge from right next to the player, a move that's virtually impossible to actually dodge, unless of course one owns a functioning crystal ball. Despite being extremely poorly explained, the pick slash axe requirement means that players will have ruins gear by the time they encounter the beast and fight it, so the extreme nature of its attacks is somewhat justified. That being said, I do feel like its combo potential against the player is quite high, especially when it decides to charge you from point blank range and unavoidably eat away 40% of your football helmet's durability. Once the boss reaches 50% health, it enters its second phase, in which it gains the ability to heftily smash the ground, dealing extra damage and rupture the very earth. This attack is easier to dodge than the charge with quite a lengthy wind-up animation, so be sure to sidestep and punish the boss for overextending. This attack is the only way to destroy the pillars and obtain one of the boss's rare drops, another poorly explained mechanic that players are supposed to figure out themselves somehow, except it isn't actually explained at all. Upon defeat, the boss will drop the new other resource and then promptly go on an idyllic retreat to the Swiss Alps, returning 20 days after its fulfilling holiday only to find itself trussed up like a turkey once more. The new resources can be used to make a new loadout of armor, the dreaded Dreadstone set. This set is essentially a beefier version of the knight armor, except it can regen durability. The lower the wearer's sanity, the faster the restoration. Armor that comes back is quite a luxury to have and don't starve, making this set very desirable. What isn't desirable is the fashion. The pieces do look a bit lumpy. The special resources don't really do much else yet, although interestingly, pure horror can be used to refuel things the same way nightmare fuel can, with twice the potency. Wilson's Shadow Courtier ability, unlocked by unlocking 12 abilities and defeating Fuel Weaver, permits him to perform alchemy on the new resources, much like his basic transmutation unlocks. He can also turn pure horror into two nightmare fuel. And on a random note, the update also adds the beloved beard hair rugs from Hamlet into the game, accessible to every character. An excellent way to use all that extra beard hair floating around, and to create some cool pixel art on the map too. Here's one I made earlier. That's about all the content this update adds. New raid bosses that aren't exorbitantly overpowered for no reason is always good in my books. So you know what? Pretty solid fight, aside from some minor qualms that I had. Same goes for the skill tree system. Going off the assumption it's going to be added to every character, which, let's face it, it probably is, seems like a pretty solid way to add more depth to characters and potentially even sub playstyles, something which I really hope Clay does go for. Another thing that I really like about this update is the story aspect of the Nightmare Werepig. There's something genuinely eerie about this gigantic thing appearing, chained up somewhere in the caves. It also appears to be intelligent, initially begging to be freed, but resorting to insulting and taunting the player during combat. It's great. More bosses that have some sort of dialogue with the player are always fun. And not to mention the fact that it doesn't actually die and just kind of disappears once killed. Whack. Anyway, thanks for watching this video, much appreciated. Even more appreciated is Lumpkin for editing this son of a bitch. Thank you. My soul belongs to the university gods at the moment, so yeah. Have a good one, and I'll see you around.